So let's say we have two computers here, and we want to send some data from one computer to the other. So as we've seen before, we can connect the cable between them, and then maybe vary the voltage uh, across two of the wires within this cable, like say between 0 volts and 5 volts. And 0 volts is a symbol that represents a 0, and 5 volts is a symbol that represents a 1. And so we can send some binary data this way, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. But something interesting is happening right here, which is we have a bunch of zeros in a row. And in order to know exactly how many zeros we have here, uh, we, need, we need to make sure that both of these computers have a synchronized clock. And this is something that's actually very important uh, in networking is, is timing, uh, to make sure that both sides of, these, of this link agree um, on a clock rate. So if I add a clock rate here, this is a, a signal basically that just alternates between 0 and 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And what we can do is we can look at this clock everywhere it transitions from 0 to 1. That is a point at which we should read the value of the data. So we have a data signal here, and we have a clock signal here. And so for this example here, where we have this whole string of zeros, if we just look at how many transitions, or exactly when these transitions occur from 0 to 1 on the clock, we can see you know, this transition the data is a 1, this transition it's a 0, this transition it's another 0, this transition is another 0, another 0, another 0, and then a 1. And as long as we keep track of these transitions, we know exactly how many uh, zeros we have, no matter how long this stretch of data is, as long as we have this clock. But the important thing is that both sides of this link agree on the same clock, so that the computer that is uh, sending this data is using the same clock rate as the computer that's receiving it. So now you might be wondering what happens if these two, co two computers' uh, clock signals aren't running at exactly the same speed. Um, so like maybe, maybe the receiver's computer is a little bit slow. So I can show you actually what that might look like if we take that out and bring this in and actually get rid of these little transitions. So this here is a clock that is running a little bit slower than, um, than the data was originally clocked at. Um, and so what you see here is that you see here's a transition, and we get a 0, another transition a 1. And these are, these are actually lining up pretty well so far. So this 0 kind of is lining up. But here, you notice we missed a 0. There should be a 0 here. And then this stuff lines up pretty well. Um, and again, we miss a 0. And then things are lining up OK. But here, in this stretch where we had five zeros before, now with a slightly slower clock, we're only reading four zeros. And then we have this last one here. Um, and so the places where we're missing bits because of this mismatch, I guess, between transmit and receive clocks are called clock slips. So this is a clock slip because we're, we're basically missing a bit of information. Um, and then and, and you might have the, the sort of um, opposite of this if the receiving clock were running faster you might actually get extra bits in there. But either way, we, we would refer to that as a, as a clock slip. So this here is a clock slip. And uh, of course, if, you know, if, if we're missing bits like this, then the, the data that we're receiving um, isn't, isn't going to make any sense. So, so clearly, we don't want the, the two computers' clocks to be out of sync like this. So even if they're a little bit out of sync, you know, of course, this is kind of an extreme example here where you know, we were sending 16 bits and we only received 13 bits. Um, but even if, even if these clocks are just a little bit out of sync, you know, eventually, over time, we will have a clock slip. And, and that'll corrupt our message. And, and we would have to either re retransmit our message or, or somehow um, figure out what happened there. So it, it's important to make sure that these clocks are in sync. And there are a couple ways that we can do that. One way that we can make sure that clocks are in sync is actually for both of these computers to, to have synchronized clocks that are either synchronized maybe through a GPS antenna. So these computers would have little antennas that would connect or that would actually receive signals from GPS satellites, which are the, the global positioning system satellites. Because the GPS satellites actually have atomic clocks on board and have very, very accurate clocks. Um, and so if these computers have those GPS receivers, they can synchronize their own clocks to the GPS clocks um, and then know that the, the clocks between the two computers are, are in sync 
and, and use those clocks for sending and receiving data. Um, there's obviously some, some disadvantages to that. Uh, the GPS antenna is, is extra hardware, so it's a little bit, a little bit expensive. Um, and you also need to be able to mount the antenna somewhere outside or, or on the roof of the building or something like that. But there, there's definitely some network equipment that, that is in use on the internet uh, that uses GPS timing uh, to, synchronize, uh, to synchronize its clock and data. Um, so that is, that is one solution. Another solution is actually to have an atomic clock in the computer itself. Um, and that's, it, it, you know, occasionally uh, that is done. Um, it, it's fairly, fairly uncommon. Um, another approach that, that you could take is we get rid of our slow clock and bring back our normal clock here. Another approach that you can take is to actually send a separate signal. So we have a separate, uh, we have like another, another link or another pair of, of wires between these computers where we send this clock signal. So we're sending both the, the data and the clock. Um, across two different links. And so that way, this computer doesn't need to use its own clock. It can actually receive the clock from the same computer that's sending the data, so it knows that these are in sync. Um, and there's actually a little bit of a problem with that as well, or a potential problem with that, which is that at, as, as you increase the speed that you're sending this data, um, these clock pulses could, could actually be as, as close as just a few nanoseconds apart. Um, and so it's very important that the clock and the data line up. Because um, if you can imagine this clock were shifted just a little bit to the left or to the right, um, then these, these points where the clock transitions from a zero to a one might not line up exactly with the bits, um, and you could misread a bit. So it's very important that these stay uh, lined up correctly. And, um, and that's called clock phase. Phase. And one of the problems with sending a clock and a data across two separate links is that it's possible that um, the the you know the uh, propagation of electrons, <laughs> literally across one of these links, might be slightly slower, um, either because it takes a slightly different path or the conductivity is a little bit different if this is a long path. So you tend to not want to do this on very high speed links over uh, very long distances. Um, or you could get into an issue where the clock gets slightly out of phase with the data and you start to misread uh, some, some bits. So another approach that, that we can take that's actually quite common is, is kind of ingenious, which is to combine um, the clock and the data by using different symbols to represent ones and zeros. So just to review, um, what we've been doing here is when we're transmitting our data, we're, we're transmitting it using two symbols. And so when we want to send when we want to send a one, the symbol that we're using is five volts. So you can see here, every time we're sending a one, our symbol is that we are setting the, the voltage to five volts. When we want to send a zero, the symbol we use is zero volts. So now let's see what happens when we change that. So instead of making, instead let's try to make the, the symbol for sending a one. Instead of making it five volts, let's make it actually the, the symbol will be transitioning from zero volts to five volts. So this is zero volts, this is five volts. And the symbol for a one is a transition from zero to five. And then what we can do is the symbol for sending a zero will be a transition from five volts to zero volts. So this was five volts and we're transitioning to zero volts. So before the symbol that we were using was, the symbol we were using for sending a one is a, just a five volt signal. Now let's try sending a transition from zero volts to five volts as the symbol. Um, so what we can do is here is that same signal right here that we were sending up here. Let me so we can see both of these. So this is the same the same data, the zero one zero zero one zero and so on, um, is now being sent using this scheme. So for example, here we have a transition from five volts to zero volts. So this is five volts. Oops. This is a transition from five volts to zero volts. And so this is a zero. And here we have a transition from zero to five, so that's a one. Here we have another transition from five volts to zero volts, so that transition represents a zero. And this is again a transition from five volts to zero volts, so that represents a zero. This represents a one, a zero, a one, a one, zero, a one, 
And then here you can, again, see those transitions from 5 volts to 0 volts. This is a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So very clearly there's five of those transitions, so we know there are five zeros. And then finally we have that transition from 0 volts to 5 volts, and that's a 1. So you might be wondering, um, you know, what's going on like here, for example. Uh, the, we're transitioning from 0 volts to 5 volts, um, so shouldn't we, shouldn't we like count this as a 1 in here? Um, and so actually, uh, we, we shouldn't because there's still a, a clock, and we still expect to see each bit at a regular time interval. Um, so for example, you can see there's, there's still like a, a regular interval here where these bits are, are occurring. And, and the receiver can easily tell that, that this, this short interval here is, is drastically different than the regular interval that we see everywhere else. Um, and so the, the receiver can, can just ignore this uh, because, it, because it doesn't match the, the symbol rate, you know, even if the receiver's clock isn't completely perfect. Um, so this method of encoding that, that I've described here is called Manchester coding. Manchester coding. And I believe it's named after the, uh, I think it was, uh, I guess, invented at the University of Manchester uh, in, in the UK. And so Manchester coding is, is just an example of one of the simpler ways of combining clock and data into one signal so that the transmitter and receiver don't need perfectly synchronized clocks. Um, and so Manchester coding also happens to be the type of line coding used by lower speed Ethernet, which many, many computers use for connecting to wired networks. So in the next video, We'll look at exactly how Ethernet uses Manchester coding in, in some more detail.